Well, good afternoon. Welcome back. Today we're going to start getting into some nuts and bolts about viruses. We are going to talk about what I call the infectious cycle. So let's first define that. What is an infectious cycle? It's everything that happens from when a virus attaches to a cell and new viruses come out at the end of the cycle. That's the infectious cycle. And sometimes I'll call it the reproductive cycle. Other people call it a replication cycle. They all mean roughly the same thing. So here is a diagram of a generic <coughs> replication cycle, which shows that we divide it into steps so that we can study it. And many of us specialize in just one of the many steps of the cycle. But of course, in a cell, there are no steps. It all happens in a continuum. We just do that to make it easier conceptually. So here in this theoretical infectious cycle, we start with attachment and entry. And many of these steps, we're going to have a separate lecture on. And attachment and entry is one. Viruses attach to very specific receptors on the cell surface. And then they're brought into the cell by pathways like endocytosis. And then that second red arrow is translation. At some point, mRNA has to be made, and it's then translated into proteins. That step differs for different viruses, depending on whether it's a DNA or an RNA virus, as you're going to see. If it's a DNA virus, first you have to make the mRNA. And where that happens depends on the virus. Some viruses go into the nucleus. Some stay in the cytosol. But you're going to learn ways to figure out how to sort all that out. And then, of course, if you're an RNA virus, sometimes the RNA is already to, to be translated. It's an mRNA, but sometimes it's the opposite polarity. So there are lots of different things that can happen leading to translation. So viral proteins are made, and those proteins have a number of functions. They first have to make more viral genomes. They have to do what we call genome replication. And, of course, they have to make new virus particles. And that leads to assembly. You take viral proteins, viral genomes, put them together, and then you have release of the virus particles from cells. So that constitutes the entire reproduction cycle or the infectious cycle. And what I want to do today is uh, tell you why this is important, how we study it, some of the methods that we use. But first, a couple of very important terms. Uh, I'm a stickler for terminology because well, I wrote a virology book, and the way you make you define a word in the first page has to be the same as the last page, right? If you use different definitions, you're in trouble. And so I'm very much a stickler about this. Many virologists are not, uh, but I am. And here are some definitions that are going to be important for you throughout the course. And they will for sure show up on an exam somewhere. And then you'll remember them for the rest of your lives, I'm sure. <laughs> Susceptible cells, when we talk about susceptible cells, what I mean is the cell has a receptor for the virus. The virus can bind to it. That's all it means. Many other people will say uh, this cell is susceptible to infection and mean much more than I do, but don't pay attention. For this course, susceptible has a receptor. The cell may or may not be able to support virus replication. So on the upper right there, I have two diagrams to illustrate this. It's our infectious cycle diagram. The, the one on the left, the virus is getting in and going through all the steps and out come viruses. So that virus can bind to that cell. It's susceptible, but it also is able to support replication, which is not part of susceptible definition. Here's another cell on the right that can just bind virus, but it doesn't produce more virus particles. There's something incompatible inside the cell. That is still a susceptible cell. Okay, a resistant cell simply doesn't have a receptor. And so here, these two cells don't have receptors has no implication about what happens beyond virus binding. Again, it doesn't mean anything about whether the cell can actually <coughs> replicate the virus. It just means that there's no receptor. Now we go to a permissive cell. This is a cell that has the capacity to replicate the virus, whether or not it's susceptible, i.e., whether or not it has a receptor. And here are two examples. These cells are both permissive because the virus is able to go through the entire infectious cycle in it. One has the receptor and one does not. Now you may say, 
how do we know that there are such cells that are permissive but they don't have receptors? It's very easy. You extract the viral genome from the virus and you introduce it into the cell. We call that transfection. You can bypass the need for a receptor. You're putting nucleic acid in the cell. And for some cells, if you put the RNA or DNA, the viral RNA or DNA in, it will initiate a complete infectious cycle. And that means the cell is permissive. And for some cells, it stops somewhere along the cycle. It's not permissive for infection. The only cell that will take up a virus and allow the entire infectious cycle to occur and produce more infectious viruses is a susceptible and permissive cell. You need both. You need a receptor, which is the susceptible part, and you need permissivity, which means everything beyond the receptor works for that particular virus. A cell can be not permissive for any number of reasons. The block can be very early in the cycle. It can be in the middle. It can be in the late. It doesn't really matter. The point is you don't make infectious virus. Okay, so that's susceptible and permissive. I'll use those often when I talk about viruses. So make sure that you know those. So let's do a little bit of uh, history here. Start at the very beginning. La last time we talked about virus discovery at the end of the 1800s. For many years, people could not grow viruses in cells and culture. We, we didn't have any cell culture. We had animals and plants and insects in which to grow our viruses, and that's what people did. And here are a host of animals that were used uh, very early on to study viruses. Tobacco mosaic virus, of course, the first virus discovered was studied in tobacco plants. Uh, but many of those early human viruses, they were studied in various rodents or even uh, non-human primates. And this was the case for many years, and that really limits what you can do. One of the developments that occurred was the finding that some viruses will grow in embryonated eggs, chicken eggs specifically. So not just the egg you buy at the supermarket. There's no embryo in there, or there shouldn't be, and viruses won't grow in those. But uh, these are fertilized, and they're developed to about 10 or 11 days old, when there's a little embryo there in the egg. And you can see on this diagram, you can put viruses in different places in the egg, and different viruses will grow. You can see on the right a whole list of different viruses, most of which we haven't talked about yet. But at one point, before we had cell culture, people used to use eggs uh, to grow viruses. And uh, the, the only one that I'm aware of that people still use eggs for is influenza virus. And here you actually inject the virus into the allantoic cavity that's this light blue cavity here. It's got about 10 ml of fluid per egg. It kind of is a cushion for the embryo. And it's lined with cells. And so the virus will replicate in those cells. And after a few days, you can just crack the egg open and take out the fluid, and you have lots of virus. I did this for my PhD thesis uh, over and over again because we needed lots of influenza virus. Today, much of the influenza vaccine is grown in chicken eggs. And so there are factories where this is done. There are automated machines that put needles into the uh, allantoic cavity and deliver the virus. And then they're put on, the eggs are put on racks. They're put in incubators. And then there are, again, automated machines that withdraw the, the virus, uh, the allantoic fluid with the virus in it. If you ever got a flu vaccine that's been grown in eggs, they're available from other sources as well. We'll talk about that when we talk about vaccines. But uh, one shot is about an egg's worth of virus, more or less. So next time you get it, you can think, hey, I'm getting an egg's worth of influenza virus here. Now, we also grow uh, the vaccine in cells now, but eggs are still very easy to do in massive quantities, and they use... 100, 150 million eggs a year just in the US to make flu vaccine. However, that didn't last forever. There's always progress. Uh, in 1949, someone figured it out. In fact, three individuals, John Enders, Robbins, and Weller working at Harvard Medical School. All three of them got the Nobel Prize for this discovery. They figured out that you could make cultures of cells in, in dishes and viruses would grow in them. And they, they did this first for poliovirus and then for many other viruses. 
So they showed human cell cultures. These are called primary cultures. They were embryonic tissues, and they got them at the hospital, and they made single cell suspensions. They adhered to a dish, and then they could infect them. Nobody had ever been able to do that before. So it was the first time a really important discovery. Uh, they got the Nobel Prize for that in 1954. He's on the cover of Time. Medicine gains on viruses. So this was a revolution because now people could not only study viruses in cells and culture, but it allowed vaccine production. And uh, this was why the first polio vaccine could be made in 1954, the Salk vaccine and many others following. And so now we use cell cultures routinely. We tell you a little bit about cell cultures. We have on the left primary cells. These are human foreskin fibroblasts. And foreskin, you may say, why foreskin? Because they throw it away. Right? When they do a circumcision, they throw it away in the hospital. And if you work in a medical center, you can go and get it and use it for your research. You chop it up and digest it with trips and make single cells. And a lot of viruses will grow in them. These are primary, which means you make them from a tissue. But after 10 or 20 or 30 doublings, they die. So they're not ideal. Then we have cell lines here. We have a mouse cell line and a human cell line. This one's the HeLa cell line, a very famous one. And these are cells that started out as a primary cell line, but they became immortal. And we'll talk about immortality of cells in a separate lecture, but they basically can divide uh, forever. So many laboratories use those. We call these continuous cell lines. You can't grow vaccines in these because they're abnormal. They have abnormal numbers of chromosomes. They are transformed. Sometimes we use cell strains that have a limited duration of doublings, but longer than a primary cell. So uh, we use, of course, cell lines in our laboratory. On the left, are, it's a CO2 incubator with various plates uh, and well, uh, six well plates and small plates and, and flasks full of cells. We, and, and in these uh, configurations, these are plastic disposable dishes. Uh, the, they are covered with medium, and the cells are adhering to the bottom. They stick to it. So when you take the medium off, the cells are stuck to it. You can put your virus on and so forth. If you need a lot of cells, you can grow them in what are called spinner cultures. So we, we at one time used very many HeLa cells to do plaque assays, as you'll see. And so you grow them in like a leader with a magnet spinning uh, at the bottom in a warm room. And you can grow many, many, many billions of cells this way. Of course, HeLa cells uh, were made in the 1950s by taking a piece of a tumor from a young lady, Henrietta Lacks, in Baltimore. Uh, and that tumor piece was subsequently put into cell culture and ended up dividing forever, the first time that it ever happened. And this, of course, is a book that is all about it by Rebecca Skloot. Her kids didn't know this. She died a few years later. Kids found out many years later, and they were kind of outraged that her cells had been taken and no one told them. So there's a book about it. There's a movie and so forth. But uh, early in the preparation of this book, Rebecca Skloot emailed me, and I helped her to get the science right in it. So it was a lot of fun working with her. Nowadays, besides cell cultures, we still use them. We have all kinds of other amazing ways, because the cell and culture is pretty far removed from an animal, right? We're trying to get closer and closer to it. And here's two ways that we can do that. On the left, organoid cultures. We can approximate the structure of specific organs using these cultures. There are two ways you can do it. One, you can start with a, a blastocyst and take out the inner cell mass. These are called embryonic stem cells, and they can be differentiated into different organoids, depending on the treatment you give them. Because, of course, these cells are pluripotent. They eventually differentiate into everything. So you can make gastric organoids, liver, et cetera. And depending on what virus you're working with, you might want to make one or the other, depending on where it's replicating. On the bottom, you can also take a somatic cell and make it pluripotent. It's amazing technology. You take uh, any somatic cell. You could take a skin cell, introduce a few plasmids into it that produce different transcriptional regulators, it will now become a stem cell, and you can differentiate that into organoids as well. So organoids are really revolutionizing virology. On the right 
are what we call air-liquid interface cultures. The epithelium that lines the respiratory tract, in fact, all of your mucosal layers, is very special. It's exposed to the atmosphere, so it has an apical side that's uh, exposed to the air, and then the basal lateral is uh, adjacent to tissues. And you can approximate that by first taking cells, for, say from a, you could take it from a human biopsy of the lung or from a mouse or other animals, and you can make a monolayer of those in these very special wells where they're sitting on a, perme a, a, a membrane that's permeable, and then you have liquid on top and on the bottom. You wait till they're confluent, that is all the cells are touching each other. Then you remove the liquid on the top only, and they go, air! And they differentiate. They think that they're back in the lung where they came from. And they become uh, a mucosal epithelial layer with all the different cell types, the ciliated epithelium, the mucus producing cells, and so forth. So these, those are called ALI, and they're very powerful as well. A lot of cool things you can do uh, with cell culture. Time for a question. It is, the, it is uh, a blank and blank cell is the only cell that can take up a virus and replicate it. So here are the choices for the blank and blank. Naive and resistant, primary and permissive, susceptible and permissive, susceptible and naive, continuous and immortal. How do we do? 100%. Wow, that's two days in a row. Very impressive. <laughs> Okay, good. That's right. Susceptible and permissive is correct. All right, so we have cell lines, we have organoids, we have really cool things to study viruses in. First, let's ask a couple or answer a couple of questions. First of all, how do you know if the cells are infected? I give you a nice monolayer, you put virus on, how do you know that they're infected? And there are a couple of ways we can do that. One is by simply looking at them in a light microscope and looking for what we call cytopathic effect, CPE. And that is changes in the cells that are visible through a light microscope. And so here we have pictures of HeLa cells in culture that are infected with poliovirus. On the upper left is the monolayer before it's infected. Lovely monolayer. All the cells are touching each other from one side of the plate to the other. And then we infect it, we take off the medium, we add a small volume with poliovirus in it, we let the virus attach, and then we add fresh medium, and then we incubate. And on the top right, something like uh, four hours post-infection, eight hours, and 12 hours. And I think you can see things are happening here. It's obvious to you. On the upper right, some cells appear to be rounding up, Right? There are gaps in the monolayer now, and by um, eight hours, most of them are rounded up, and by 12 hours, a lot of them have broken or lysed. So that's one form of cytopathic effect. You could look at your culture and say, my cells are clearly infected. Now, let's say you're working with a new coronavirus in China, right? You have a little um, nasal wash from a patient with pneumonia, and you want to see if there's some virus in it. You, yeah, first thing is you have to figure out what cells to use. And so there's some history there with coronaviruses. So you get the right cell and you put the virus on and then you look at it every so hours and if you see some CPE, it looks like the virus is replicating. There are many kinds of CPE. Here's another one. So the one I showed you was cells rounding up and lysing. Here's one where the cells fuse. So this is infected with viruses that induce the formation of proteins on the surface of the cells that cause the cells to fuse. We will explore why this happens in a bit in another lecture. But here, basically, uh, on the upper left there, that cell is making a viral fusion protein with the, it's the red Y, and that binds to a receptor on a neighboring cell and induces the two to fuse. So we will now where we had two cells, we have one, and these can fuse with many other cells. And you can have what we call giant cells with multiple nuclei, or syncytia. That's what this is called. And here's a, a light micrograph of this phenomenon. Uh, these are single cells, you can see, and in the middle is a big one with multiple nuclei. That's the one with the black arrow. There are a number of viruses that do this, including measles virus, cause fusion, because they have a protein encoded in their genome that does this. So here's a summary of, of different sorts of CPE for different viruses. I don't need you to remember 
any of these specifically. All you need to do is that cy no, is that cytopathic effect you know, are the visible changes in cells that occur when viruses infect them. And you can see, depending on the virus here on the right-hand column, you get all kinds of different things happening. Syncytium formation is there. I showed you that. Uh, what else did I show you? Rounding up and detachment of cells, right? I showed you an example of each of these, but there are other things, nuclear shrinking, vacuoles, virions in the nucleus, ribosomes in, in the cytosol and so forth. So some of these are more subtle than others, and some of them are actually specific for a virus. In the old days, before we had rapid diagnostic methods, people could actually look at tissue sections and have an approximation of what was infecting you. We don't need to do that anymore because we can do PCR, which is faster and more specific. But at one time, this was diagnostic. And today, again, if you're working in the lab growing your virus, you use this to say, yeah, my, my infection is working or not. All right, so that tells you how you know that your virus is replicating. So now your experiment is over. You've taken the supernatant of the cells. We centrifuge away all the cells after the infection's over. We have a supernatant. Now you have, you can put that supernatant into little tubes, as you see here. We like to put liquids in small tubes and label them and uh, freeze them and so forth. But then you, you would like to know how much virus is there because if you're gonna do subsequent experiments, you need to know what we call the virus titer, or how much virus is present. So there are two ways that you can do this. You can measure infectivity or you can measure physical properties, particles and their components. So I wanna give you an idea of both kinds of assay. We, the most important in my view is the infectivity, but sometimes you can't do that, so we'll talk about both of them. We'll start with an assay called the plaque assay. And this was first developed in the 1930s to study viruses of bacteria, bacteriophages. Now when the first bacteriophages were discovered in the early 1900s, they immediately had a plaque assay to study them, that's how they were first found, that the, that the phages caused clearing on bacterial lawns, as you can see here. But it wasn't until the 30s that they were used uh, quantitatively. So here is a plaque assay of a bacteriophage. This is essentially an auger plate on which there is a lawn of bacteria growing, and where, where you see each of those clearings, that's where a, a bacteriophage has made a zone of lysis. And this is the kind of thing you can do in high school it's pretty safe, so a lot of people get their first experience with uh, viruses in labs with bacteriophages. So each of those circles, and I'll explore this for you in some detail in a moment, each circle is caused by a single virus starting an infection of a cell, which then breaks open and the, the infection spreads until the clearing is big enough for you to see it. And then you can count these and calculate the titer of the virus in what we call plaque forming units per milliliter. In the 50s, it was developed for animal viruses by Renato Dulbeco. Here's the, the paper he published. He was at Caltech, 1952. Production of plaques in monolayer cultures by single particles of an animal virus. And here's the, one of his pictures in the, um, in the paper. So he took what we knew about phage plaque assays, and he converted it for animal viruses. Of course, it's a totally different assay because here we have a monolayer of cells and uh, there's no auger on which the cells are growing and so forth. But he ended up getting it to work for them and he got a Nobel Prize in 1975. So here's how a plaque assay works. So I give you a tube of virus. That would be our virus stock there, all the way on the left. You make tenfold dilutions. You take phosphate buffered saline, you put 0.9 mLs of that into a bunch of tubes, and then you take 0.1 mL of your virus stock, you put it in the first tube, you mix it up, take a 0.1 mL out of that, et cetera. You go all the way down the line. We call that serial tenfold dilutions. And so then you will have minus one, two, three, four, all the way out to minus seven, or whatever you do, depending on how well your virus grows. And then to do the plaque acid, to do the titration, and the reason you do these dilutions, of course, is because you don't know exactly the titer of the virus. It could be 10 to the 3, or it could be 10 to the 9th per mil. So you do a range of dilutions. And then you take 0.1 ml, typically, and plate that on top of a monolayer of cells. So you have cells growing in culture. You remove the medium. You put 0.1 ml of your virus dilution. You let the virus attach for 
typically an hour at uh, 37 degrees. And then you add an auger overlay and put it back in the incubator. And what will happen is you will get plaques, just as we did on the bacteriophage plate, except these are now animal viruses making holes in the cell monolayer. You can count them and see, for example, we have a minus 6 dilution here. We have plated out 0.1 ml. Uh, so that's a total of minus 7 in the dilution. We have 17 plaques. So the titer of the virus is 1.7 times 10 to the 8th PFU per ml. 17 plaques on a dilution of 10 to the minus 7. It's very simple calculation, nothing fancy about it. Let me tell you a little bit about how the plaque assay works. So here on the top is a depiction of it. We have a plate of cells growing in a small dish with medium on top. The cells are side to side, as you can see in this blow up. When a virus infects a single cell, that cell is, has already lysed here in the middle. So one cell is infected. That cell releases viruses. They infect neighboring cells. And those release viruses, and they infect more cells until the clearing gets big enough that you can see it. The agar is important because it restricts the diffusion of the virus. If you had liquid on top, the virus would spread throughout the culture, and every cell would be infected in lice. You wouldn't be able to count plaques. So agar is a key part of the plaque assay because it restricts the movement of the virus. Now, on the bottom left is a light microscope image of a single plaque. So this is rather high magnification. And you can see the, the cells of the monolayer. And in the middle, the cells are rounded up, and they're dead. They're killed by the virus. That is a single plaque. Sometimes viruses don't kill cells, and you can't do a plaque assay. And one solution is you could put a gene into their genome that makes a color. And here on the right is a virus that makes a blue color. So you don't have to worry about it, the virus killing the cells. You can just count blue plaques instead. So there are lots of ways you can get around that. Now here is a movie of the formation of a plaque. This is a time-lapse movie. It's going to cycle. What they did was they found, they infected a monolayer and they found a single infected cell and then they focused the camera and took a frame every minute or so. And the upper left, you can see, it goes up to 15 hours total. And what you see happening is that initially the infection is small, and then it spreads. And that's as cells are lysing, they're releasing virus, they're infecting new ones and spreading out. It's sort of like dropping a pebble into a pond and making a ripple. So the plaque is getting bigger and bigger. This movie was made about 10 years ago just at the beginning of when I started teaching. And uh, it just is a beautiful way to illustrate what's going on. This is the greatest movie ever made, in my opinion. <laughs> because I think the plaque assay is just the best assay ever devised. Now, we do a lot of plaque assays in my lab. And this, uh, this is one uh, result of one of them. I had a person in my lab five years ago. She did an experiment with 1,600 six-well plates. It was all one experiment. She did assay, and I decided to keep them and make a wall, and we call it the wall of polio. These are some students from the class last year who had come for the last office hours. So if you come for office hours, you can see this work of art. It's really magnificent. It goes from floor to ceiling. 1,600 and some plates, the wall of polio. I know you think I'm crazy, but I think the plaque assay is amazing, and why not make a... Um, a wall out of it. Okay, we have a new question here. Okay, when doing a plaque assay, what's the purpose of adding a semi-solid overlay on the monolayer? So, A, to stabilize particles. B, ensure the cells remain susceptible and permissive. C, to act as a pH indicator. D, to keep cells adherent to the plate during incubation. E, to restrict viral diffusion after lysis of infected cells. Okay, how did we do? So most of you got the right answer, which is E, to restrict viral diffusion after lysis of infected cells. Remember, if you have a liquid overlay, not an auger, this virus will diffuse everywhere and infect all the cells. So that's the purpose of the auger overlay. It's not to keep the cells adherent. The, the cells will adhere under a liquid overlay. That's how you grow them. Now, an important question to answer is how many viruses are needed to form a plaque? Because if you're going to measure the virus titer, by a plaque assay, you have to make sure that 
one virus will make a plaque. And this is a relatively easy question to answer. You do a dose response curve. What does that mean? Well, you take your virus and you make different dilutions of it and you do a plaque assay. So here that's graphed on the x-axis. We have virus concentration. So it's going from low to high. And on the y-axis is simply the number of plaques. That's what a dose response curve is. And according to mathematical principles, if you, if you need one virus to make a plaque, you should get a straight line because that's one hit kinetics. The number is proportional to the concentration of virus. And that's what you see in the red line here. So for many viruses, this turned out to be true. Some viruses actually have two hit kinetics. You need two particles to infect a cell because they're, the genome is packaged in two particles and not one. For most viruses, the genome comes in one particle, but for some it's in two. They both have to infect the cell. So you get two hit kinetic, the number of plaques is proportional to the square of the concentration. You get this kind of a curve here. So that's how we know that one plaque is formed by one virus. Plaque assay is also useful for cloning viral stocks. And I use cloning in the old word before recombinant DNA. If you have a plate of cells where you've done a plaque assay, uh, you can often visualize the plaques by holding it up to the light. You can circle one with a marker, and then you can go back into the hood, take a pipette, and plunge it into the auger. You now have a little auger plug above the plaque, which has virus in it. And you can put that into a tube of PBS, and then you can repeat this two or three times more. And this is our way of purifying viruses, say, from a clinical isolate to make sure that you have one virus uh, that you're starting with. It's called plaque purification. As I mentioned earlier, some viruses don't kill cells. You can't do a plaque assay. There are other ways that we can measure virus titer, and this is one of them. It's called endpoint dilution assays. And what we do here is we take a 96-well plate. Each of these wells has a monolayer of cells in it. And we plate dilutions of viruses here from 10 to the minus 2 to 10 to the minus 7 from top to bottom. We just do replicates across the well to the, the plate to the right. So the first line gets all minus two, the second gets all minus three, et cetera. So you infect these cells with that dilution. You add, you add your liquid overlay. Now we're not counting plaques because this virus doesn't plaque. And then you incubate it and you see uh, which cells are killed by infection, which cells show CPE, and then you score it. And that's what's shown here. So let's say after two days of incubation, you score cytopathic effect and very simply, plus if there is and minus if there isn't. And you can see at the very low dilutions, all the cells show CPE. So it tells you there's probably a good amount of virus here. And then as we get higher and higher dilutions, you see you get more and more minus. No CPE until uh, 10 to the minus 7. There's none. And then you calculate the dilution at which you get half of the wells showing CPE. And that would be the 50% uh, infectious dose then, or infectious titer. And uh, that on this, on this particular experiment, that's 10 to the minus 5. You can see there are 5 pluses and 5 minuses. Often it doesn't fall exactly like that. There often is a mixture. But you can use math to in interpolate, excuse me, interpolate uh, the infectious dose 50%. So this is done often for viruses that do not make plaques, or for people who don't want to do plaque assays. Sadly, there are some of those in the world. They would rather do this than a plaque assay. I don't understand it. Another key concept is that not every virus particle that is made by a cell is infectious. Some of them are broken in many ways. And we can quantify this by what we call the particle to PFU ratio. And that's shown in this table here. It is simply the number of physical particles divided by the number of infectious particles. So the bottom, the denominator, we can do by plaque assay. We can figure out how many PFU there are. The top, you have to do some kind of physical measurement. You can count particles in an electron microscope. You can do spectrophotometric measurement. But the point is, you divide the two, and you get a particle to PFU ratio. And on this table, you see that viruses have a big range in their particle to PFU ratio. Some, for example, down here, some leaky forest virus, almost every particle is infectious. It has particle to PFU of one or two. And that's very interesting that 
it seems to be very robust. But other viruses are less so. Here, for influenza virus, for every infectious particle, there are 20 to 50 non-infectious particles in any preparation. And some viruses, they're 10,000 to one. So viruses vary in the number of defective viruses that they make in any infectious cycle. And this is very important, of course, because if your virus has a very high particle to PFE ratio, and you're looking at infections biochemically, you don't know if your signal is actually the infectious or the non-infectious population. So it's very important to consider. This one, this one hit kinetics of a plaque formation, that tells you that a single particle can initiate an infection, right? One hit means a single particle can, but from the particle to PFU ratio, we know that not all viruses are successful at doing that. And you wouldn't find that out in the one hit kinetic curve. Why is that? Sometimes particles are damaged as they grow in cells. Biology isn't perfect, as you know. On the right is an electron micrograph of a preparation of polioviruses. And you can see there's some there that look empty, right? They're just a shell. They're shells of their former selves. And those are not infectious. One of the reasons is that they're broken during assembly. They don't get RNA in it, or they lose it later on. So they're damaged. Genomes can sustain mutations. Another reason I like to think is that, you know, the infectious cycle, you have to attach, the virus has to get in, has to translate into proteins, has to replicate its genomes, et cetera. Every step has to occur in order for the whole cycle to finish. And if you stop at any one step for whatever reason, you don't get a virus particle. So that could be another reason as well. As I mentioned earlier, this complicates the study of viruses because you never know if every virus you're looking at is infectious. But that's an important concept to understand that in any preparation of virus, not all are infectious, and it varies according to the kind of virus you're working with. All right, our next question is, in this particle to PFU ratio, particle can best be described as one of the proteins which makes up the virus, a virus which may or may not be infectious, a virus which is infectious, a virus which is not infectious, elementary or composite. Okay, how did we do? Right, a particle which may or may not be infectious. The numerator can be either one. The denominator is infectious. So the numerator is everything. All the particles in a prep, infectious plus non-infectious. The denominator is infectivity. That's where you get this particle to PFE ratio. Another key experimental tool is what we call the one-step growth cycle. We talked about this a little bit last time. I want to explain it a little more and tell you why it's useful. This was de developed in 1939 for the study of E. coli bacteriophages. And what you do, in this case, you take your bacteria, you add your bacteriophage solution, you let the bacteriophage absorb or attach to the bacteria, then you dilute the culture to stop the new infections, and then you incubate it and you measure the production of virus at different times after infection. And so by adding the bacteriophages to the bacterium, you're, you're synchronizing the infection, so all cells are infected, and then you dilute it to stop the infection. And so what happens here is that you get this typical curve where we're looking at time versus the number of particles made. You see there's an eclipse period where we don't see any infectivity. So we take time points every so often here, we do a plaque assay, and for the first time, whatever it may be, it could vary for different viruses, it could be minutes or hours, there's no virus, infectious virus detectable, we call that the eclipse, and then suddenly at some point, viruses, infectious viruses start to be produced until the cells are all destroyed and no, no more can be produced, and then the, the production plateaus. So this is called the burst or the yield of virus, that's what's produced during this infectious cycle. That is a one-step growth cycle because it, you, all the cells are infected, they all produce virus, and then they're all killed. One step of infection. There are things happening here in this early period. The, RNA, the genome is out of the particle, it's in the cell, mRNA is made, translation is going on, proteins are being made, but you do not detect virus, infectious virus. Right. But be, since this was done first in 1939, they actually didn't know about mRNA and all that. They just 
saw that there was a lag. They figured something was going on, but they didn't know what. Now that is a one-step cycle. Every cell is infected. And this is extremely valuable for studying the properties of your virus. Now, I'm, I've been looking for a one-step curve with the new coronavirus. Nobody's published one yet, but I'm expecting one in the next few weeks. And I will show it to you when someone does it because he'd like to know what cells this virus can infect. What's the kinetics? Is it fast? Is it slow? Does it make a lot of virus? And so forth. Very interesting questions. And if you make mutants, if you have antiviral drugs, you will use a one-step growth curve to test the drugs to see how they affect virus production. So an incredibly powerful assay. You can make it multi-step by using less virus to begin with. So here on the right is a multi-step growth curve. You dilute the virus so you're infecting fewer cells to start. You still have an eclipse period. You have the first burst where not all the cells are producing virus, just a fraction of them. They make virus. That goes on and infects more cells. You get a second burst. And depending on how dilute you make it, you can have multiple bursts. This can be useful if you don't see a difference in a one-step growth curve and you want to make sure that there is something going on, you can do a multi-step, and typically it's more sensitive to, say, antiviral compounds. So that's the one-step uh, growth cycle for a bacteriophage. Of course, we can do these with animal viruses. Here's an example with an adenovirus, which is a big DNA-containing virus that we'll come back to uh, many times in this course. Again, you take your cells in a plate, take the medium off, add virus, let it absorb, put medium on and then sample the medium at different times after infection. So that's the x-axis is time, y-axis PFU per mil. And again, you see an eclipse period where there's no infectious virus uh, in the medium. And then viruses start to be produced. And then again, they peak. Now here we have a little extra step added where we're measuring extracellular versus intracellular virus. So what we can do is take a little sample of the medium where the viruses are coming out into from the cells. We can do a plaque assay on that. That's extracellular. Then we can take the cells themselves and break them open and ask how many viruses are in them. Obviously, to do that, you need to have multiple samples, one for each time point. And if you look at the intracellular, which is red, you get an eclipse and you get virus production. But if you look at extracellular, this period of no virus lasts longer. See, another time point. And that we call the latent period. That's the time when there's no virus released from the cell. You can't find it in the cell supernatant. So the eclipse is when you look inside of a cell and you don't see virus particles. And as we said, that's the time when the viral genomes are being made and translated and so forth. The time it takes for the virus particles to get out is the latent period. So there's a lag between making an infectious particle in a cell and the time that it gets out. It either has to break the cell open or get out by some other means, as we'll see later. Okay, so that's a growth curve for uh, an animal virus. And remember, this is fundamentally different from bacteria, because bacteria divide by binary fission, right? You put one bacterium in a culture, it divides to 2, 4, 8, 16, and so forth. And viruses are fundamentally different. They make the parts and then assemble them. And I said that last time, and someone watched the video on YouTube and they put a question in there. I don't think it was one of you, but it's okay if it is. And they wrote, why do viruses have to make the parts and then assemble? It's a why question, first of all, because we can never answer why questions in biology. But I will anyway. You can't say why, because why is a philosophical question. Right? <laughs> you could say what's the mechanism of or the outcome of. It's the way they do it. That's what, that is what a virus is. It makes the parts. A virus can't divide it can't divide because it's not alive. So it has to do it another way, and that's by making the parts. Now, these a, a key to this. Once, yes? You mean the incubation period in a person? Like if I give you a coronavirus and it takes you 10 days to get sick, that's the incubation period. Right. No, it's different because during that incubation period, you're having multiple cycles of viruses infecting cells and being released. And it's only when the virus gets to a certain level in a person do you get disease. 
So it doesn't. Yes. It's longer than this eclipse period. Yes. And we, the incubation periods are very interesting. We'll talk about it later. But let me leave you with a thought. For some viruses, for some virus infections, viruses shed during the incubation period. For others, it's not. And we suspect for this new coronavirus, it is being shed during the incubation period. In contrast, during Ebola virus infection, you do not shed until you are sick. Very different. So much easier to control the spread of an Ebola infection because you can see that a person is sick. The corona a person get on a plane and go around the world and not be sick and then get somewhere and, and get sick. Well, well, we'll talk about that later. So it doesn't correspond to that period. To do a one-step growth curve, you have to infect all of the cells. That's the key. So they're all doing everything in synchrony. So now the question is, how do you know that all the cells are infected? All right, we have to infect every one of them. And there is a way to know that, and it's called the multiplicity of infection, MOI. This is a term that I'll use a lot. It is the number of infectious particles you add per cell. And it's very easy to calculate. You just take the PFU that you add and divide by the number of cells in your experiment. It's not the number of particles that each cell gets. That turns out to be different. So for example, if we add 10 to the seventh viruses to a million cells in a plate, that's an MOI of 10. So MOI is simply what you add as an investigator. What the cell actually gets is different. They don't, each cell doesn't get 10 virus particles. That is determined by a statistical distribution. Okay, So this is very important. The MOI allows you to control how much virus you add to a cell, but the number of viruses each cell gets is very different. And here's the idea. Infection is a random event. You put viruses on cells, and the collision is random. And some cells will collide with none, some will collide with one or two or three or more. It's like taking a box of tennis balls. If I had a bunch of buckets here and I threw the tennis balls into them, not every bucket would get one ball, right? Even if I had, say, 10 balls and 10 buckets, some would get none, some would get one, and more, and so forth. Same thing with virus infection of cells. And that distribution per cell is described by a, the Poisson distribution, which is shown here, and many of you have encountered before. It's a bell curve that describes the number of virus particles that any cell would get, depending on how much you add, depending on the multiplicity of infection. And here's the, the equation for the Poisson distribution, where PK is the fraction of cells that are infected by K virus particles. M is the multiplicity of infection. So we can really simplify that, and that's shown at the bottom here. So uh, uninfected cells are described by this equation, simply E to the minus M, natural log to the minus M. M is the multiplicity. And those would be uninfected cells at this, say, multiplicity of 10. You just plug 10 into here, and that would tell you how many cells are uninfected. Cells so getting one particle would be M e to the minus M. M, again, is multiplicity. And then getting multiply infected more than one is this equation, which is made by subtracting from one, which is the sum of all probabilities for uh, any value of k, the probabilities p0 and p1. So you take those two, you subtract them from one, and you get the uh, number of multiply infected cells. This is a lot easier than it sounds. Uh, so let me go through a couple of examples for you. So here, if you take a million cells, we have three plates here with a million cells each. And if we infect at a multiplicity of 10, you could take that formula I just showed you, and it will tell you that 45 cells are uninfected. So that's why you can do a synchronous infection. Basically, you're infecting all those million cells in the dish. So an MOI of 10, turns out 5 is good too. So if you want to do a one-step growth curve, an MOI of 5 or 10. The rest of the cells, aside from these very small numbers, get more than one particle. If you use an MOI of 1, it's slightly different now. You get 37% of the cells are uninfected. 37% get 1, and 26 get more than 1. So basically, 37% uninfected. You could do maybe a two- or three-step growth curve there. And then if you use an MOI of 0 0.001, 99.9% .9 of the cells are uninfected. And so that would be a really multi-step growth curve if you wanted to do a long-term study of the effect of a mutation or a drug. All right, so that's multiplicity uh, of infection. 
Again, we can calculate it for any amount of virus that we put on a cell, and we can establish conditions for a one-step growth curve or a multi-step growth curve. Talk, if cells are infected at an MOI of 10 in a one-step growth curve, you will see multiple bursts of virus release, multiple eclipse periods, a single burst of virus release, no burst, or asynchronous infection. If you wanted to do a one-step growth curve with your new coronavirus, you'd have to titrate the virus first to make sure you had a high multiplicity of infection on your cell cultures. And hopefully people are working on that right now. All right, let's see what we did. Single burst of virus release. Most of you got that. It's an MOI of 10. Remember, I said 10 was good for a one-step growth curve because if you look at the Poisson, most of the cells are infected. So you're going to get a one step when you infect all the cells. Multiple cycles, you will only get at a low MOI, one or below. Okay, so those are using infectivity to measure virus titer and some of the ways we can control a one-step growth curve. Let's look at a couple of physical measurements where we don't, our virus doesn't form plaques. You've tried as hard as you can and you can't get it to form plaques. And so now we need to do other things. And I'm gonna talk about five different categories shown here. Uh, we can use red blood cells in a process called hemagglutination. You could actually use electron microscopy to count the particles, but nobody does this because it's rather tedious. Although I know for the new coronavirus, an electron micrograph has already been published from one of the first patients. They took a little bit of uh, wash from the respiratory tract put it under an EM, and you can see what looks like a coronavirus particle. So when you're finding a new virus, it can help because we know more or less what a virus of a certain family looks like. Some particles have enzymes in them that we can measure. We can use serology, which means antibody-based tests, and we can use nucleic acid-based tests. So let's go through some of these. Hemagglutination is a really interesting assay, which is used mainly for influenza viruses. And the idea is that uh, the receptor for influenza viruses turns out to be a sugar, sialic acid, that's on red blood cells. You could buy chicken or guinea pig red blood cells from suppliers, and the virus will attach to them. It doesn't infect, but it attaches and it makes a lattice. And you can see this lattice within 30 minutes, so it's a really quick way to get an estimation of how much virus you have. And what you do is you make uh, here two-fold dilutions of your virus and mix them with red blood cells and then you let the red blood cells sit there for half an hour at room temperature. And if there's no virus present, all the, vir all the red blood cells fall to the bottom of the well and they make a little button. See that? If there's virus present, the lattice coats the side of the well. So there's this, the red blood cells are all stuck together so they can't fall down to the bottom. And you can see this goes out to about 1024, so I would call that an HA titer of 512. So that's hemagglutination. And again, when you grow influenza viruses, before you do your plaque assay and wait a couple of days, you could do this and find out very quickly. Uh, some viruses have enzymes in the particle. Retroviruses are a great example. Here's a, dis a, a diagram of a retrovirus. We'll talk a lot about these viruses in this course. This includes, of course, HIV-1 and others. The particle, besides the genome shown here in green, has an enzyme called reverse transcriptase, which takes RNA and makes a DNA copy of it. And you can measure that very readily. Here on the right is an assay for reverse transcriptase, where you take the supernatant of infected cells, you, you filter it through a piece of nitrocellulose here, and beforehand you have thrown in radioactive triphosphates, which get incorporated uh, into the DNA product made by RT, and you can see uh, that this particular infected culture is making uh, increasing amounts of, of product over time. So very easy to assay uh, the reverse transcriptase for these viruses, well, most of which do not form plaques. You can use extensively serology, and one of the formats is an ELISA enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay for looking for viral antigens or antibodies. You can, and they're both shown here. So here we have a this should be capture, not captured. It should be capture antibody because this is an antibody that you have raised against your viral protein. 
And now you take, say, nas nasal wash from a patient. You take a piece of plastic dish where the antibody is attached to it. You put the wash on top of it. If there are viral proteins present, they will be captured by the antibody. And then you use a second antibody to detect the viral protein. And you can use an antibody that's labeled with a fluorescent indicator or something else. And these are the basis for rapid diagnostic tests that are being increasingly used. And, one, and these are being now developed for the coronavirus so that we can do rapid uh, diagnosis, diagnosis rather than wait a couple of days for PCR. The other way you can do this as well is you can put the viral protein on the plastic. You add serum, and you're asking, are there antibodies to this viral protein? You use a second antibody to which is conjugated some kind of indicator. And so serological surveys where we take people and take blood and say, do you have antibodies to this virus are very important for telling us who's been infected. Because not everyone is sick, but they might have been infected and been asymptomatic. And so you would like to know, for example, what percent of people in an outbreak of the new coronavirus are actually infected versus those who are sick. I have a suspicion that a lot of people are infected but are not sick. And a serological survey will tell us that, where we put their serum on this kind of a format assay. And it will take more time to get that kind of information, but it'll come out in the course of this course, and we'll talk about it as it comes out. If you've ever seen a, uh, a dipstick test, this is how they work. You, there are very common pregnancy dipsticks tests, of course, and you, also you can go to a doctor's office and get a rapid flu diagnosis via dipstick, where you take a nasal s uh, swab and put it on the stick. These are absorbent pads uh, onto which you have antibodies, which are linked to colloidal gold, and these are antibodies against your virus protein. And so the physician will put a clinical sample here, the liquid will move down by capillary flow. It'll pick up the antibodies. And then it will move in this area where there are capture antibodies that will capture this. This antibody will bind to this antibody. And if there are, if it's positive, then you will get a test line showing positivity by the gold because that'll show up as a dark line. And these have internal controls built into them. That's what the control line is just to make sure the test is valid. So these are being increasingly developed not just for doctor's offices, but for using in the field. You can go into field conditions where you don't have any equipment and use these. And some of them are being made to make a QR code that you can then photograph with your phone and send back to another lab. And the, the QR code that forms says whether it's positive or negative. It's really very cool what can be done. We use green fluorescent protein a lot in virus research. Uh, that was That is, of course, a protein originally found in jellyfish, which fluoresces uh, under light. Uh, there it is. There's the jellyfish. There's the uh, green fluorescent protein. And now we have been able to make many, many different colors by altering the amino acid sequence of the original green fluorescent protein. And here is uh, on the right an experiment where they have used herpes viruses with seven different colors, yellow fluorescent, red fluorescent, etc., and infected them all in a single cell. You can see the array of colors, each of a different infected cell making a different color. So you can do very interesting tracking experiments. Uh, on the left is a cell infected with HIV-1. I'm going to turn the lights off because this is really very beautiful. What we've done here is we've infected with HIV-1 that is labeled with GFP. Those are the green dots. You can now see individual virus particles by light microscopy, the light is bigger than the actual particle. So those are particles of HIV-1, and these are moving into an infected cell. And these red streamers, this is the tubulin assembly of the cell labeled with an antibody, and these viruses are actually moving along the microtubules towards uh, the cell nucleus. So we can do all kinds of what we call single particle tracking and cell bio biology of virus infection using these uh, fluorescent protein markers. It's really quite remarkable. Then, of course, we have polymerase chain reaction, PCR. And I love this story because this started in the 60s. A microbiologist by the name of Tom Brock, he was at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. He was really interested in what bacteria grew in the hot waters at like Yellowstone. And he, he isolated bacteria, and one of them was Thermus aquaticus. 
And from that, many years later, someone isolated the DNA polymerase. It's called TAC. TAC polymerase, it turned out to work at high temperatures. Of course it does, because the bacteria live at high temperatures. Completely accidental discovery. Yet this has revolutionized research and diagnostics, because PCR is used for everything. And the way it works, of course, is you, have a, you want to detect the DNA, you make primers, and you do a polymerization reaction. You denature the template, you add your primers, you allow the product to be made. So now you have originally one DNA, now you have two, you denature those, repeat, you have four now, you have eight, 16, 32. You do that over and over, and eventually you get a lot of DNA that you can detect, whereas what you started with, you might not have been able to detect. We use this in the lab. We use this in industry. We use this in diagnostic. Most of the diagnoses of the new coronaviruses have been made now by PCR because we don't have an antibody-based assay yet. And I want to uh, finally tell you about sequencing, which is the last rung of this revolutionary ladder. When I was uh, a postdoc, I did a kind of sequencing called Sanger sequencing, where you uh, run samples on a gel and you can manually look at the sequence and determine it. it. Takes a long time. But since then, high throughput sequencing has been developed where you can sequence millions and millions of bases in a day of many, many samples at once. This has spawned the field called metagenomics, where you can take any sample anywhere and just sequence everything that's in it. We can identify new viruses. This is how the new coronavirus has been identified, identify new pathogens. The whole human genome can now be done in a day for $1,000, and that price keeps dropping. And I wanted to tell you what we do with this and how it's been applied to the new coronavirus. First, the data that you get from this high-throughput sequencing. We now have computer programs that can analyze it, and one of the things we do is make phylogenetic trees to compare different sequences, how they're related, and how they've evolved. And this is a typical phylogenetic tree. Here we have 10 different viruses that we have arranged on this tree that are related. The way the tree works is from left to right is the degree of genetic change. And there's typically a scale on these phylogenetic trees, which is in the number of changes over the length of the sequence that you're looking at. Uh, then you have numbers here, which are called the measure of support. This is an indication for how well these sequences cluster compared to any other clusterings that you try. And again, programs can do many iterations of the comparison to do this. And so, for example, virus 1 and 2 are more related than virus 3 and 4, and they have a common ancestor. On the left of the tree, this tree is rooted, which means there is a presumed ancestor there of all of these viruses. Most of the time, we don't actually have the rooted virus isolate because it's too long ago, and so it's implied. And so this will tell you that if you get a new isolate, we can do this analysis and see where it fits in. We're going to talk about this a lot in this course, so I want you to understand how it works. Now, here is one of the first papers that came out from uh, China a few weeks ago on this new coronavirus. So this is from the China CDC Weekly, and this is the novel genome. So let's go through what they did, because I've explained to you every step of this process. So they had a uh, sample of bronchoalveolar lavage from a patient who had pneumonia. So they put a tube into your lung all the way down to the bronchi. They put in a little uh, PBS, and then they pull it back out again. Uh, and then they say, they did a combination of Sanger, Illumina, and Nanopore sequencing. Sanger is the old style sequencing. The others are high throughput. So they take this sample and they extract the nucleic acids. Now, if they're looking for an RNA virus, they first have to use PCR to convert it to DNA because these high throughput methods only work with DNA. They got the whole genome from this sequence, 15,000 bases, and they did phylogenetic analysis, okay? So from a wash from a patient, the entire genome, phylogenetic analysis, that's shown here. This is done by the EcoHealth Alliance. And here's the phylogenetic tree of many coronaviruses, and here is the Wuhan isolate from December. So what they've done here, here you can see the scale. There's no 
um, numbers here to indicate the quality, but you can always get this information from the raw data. The tree is based on partial gene sequence, 400 base pairs of the RNA polymerase. The RNA polymerase is the only protein conserved among RNA viruses, so it makes sense to just look at that. There's a huge database of virus sequences that you can access and do this with. And look, here it is. It's right next to bat coronaviruses and the SARS coronavirus from 2003. So boom, that's immediately put in there. Without knowing anything about the virus, the sequence immediately puts it on this tree of coronaviruses. You know exactly what it is, very closely related to a bat coronavirus. So anyway, that's how they figured out that it was this new virus. Now there are tons and tons of new sequences arising. And as things emerge, uh, I will tell you more about it. This is done all the time, this high throughput sequencing to identify new pathogens. It didn't just happen in the corona story. Here's two stories of a, a virus that was causing disease in snakes and a new tick-borne virus in humans. But I want to leave you with a warning. PCR product is not the same as infectious virus. Please don't assume it's the same thing. Here's an experiment that shows that. We took mice, infected them with Zika virus, and then measured virus shedding in seminal fluids. And that's shown here. Infectious virus peaks at around day 15, and then it goes away. But if you do PCR for RNA, the RNA can be detected out to day 60. But there's no infectivity there. That's because these are just pieces of the viral RNA that, that are left, and these will give you a positive PCR signal. So it's very important to understand that just because you get a positive PCR doesn't mean that there's infectious virus present. Now, in an outbreak situation, we know that a lot of people are infected with this virus. You can assume a PCR positivity is a diagnostic. But when you're doing discovery, you have to make sure you get infectious virus in the end. And that's what they have done in China. And I want to end with this story of viruses associated with illegally imported wildlife products. People like to bring in pieces of monkeys and other animals from other countries that are dried out. They get captured at JFK because they're illegal to bring in. And a laboratory ground them up and sequenced them to see what was there. And they found viral sequences. But there's no infectious virus here. It's just little bits of RNA that are left and you can amplify. Yet, the New York Times says viruses cross borders. There are no viruses in these samples. It's nucleic acid, little bits of nucleic acids. But of course, if the uh, headline writer wrote pieces of nucleic acids in illegally imported wildlife, the editor would say, no way, you're not going to publish this. So I understand that. But I just want you to know this is not infectious virus. This is just nucleic acid. OK, next time, we're going to talk about all the different kinds of viral genomes that are present. <laughs>